All right, you can get started. Thank you for the wait. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Lauren McGlone, a senior inpatient physical therapist at MGH. I've been the primary PT in the Blake 7 NICU for the past five years. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted some opportunities where physical therapy involvement may be appropriate sooner than you may think. I'm here to give an overview of the role of PT in the ICU in general, and then discuss some details of rehab-specific management of COVID-19 patients. By the end of this presentation, I'm really hoping that you guys will be able to explain the negative sequelae of prolonged bed rest and immobility, understand the importance of early mobility and discuss the literature to support it, describe clinical manifestations, incidents, and potential long-term outcomes of ICU-acquired weakness, outline some potential solutions to perceived barriers to early mobility, and finally, to discuss opportunities for PT interventions specific to the COVID-19 population. With, with all the stress we're experiencing as of late, I wanted to inject a little humor into this presentation. I hope there are some Harry Potter fans out there. If not, I'm so sorry for the disturbing photo on the right. Um, you can see listed here are some negative effects of bed rest. Critically ill patients experience weakness because of the catabolic state that they're in, resulting in muscle wasting. Muscle wasting occurs early and rapidly in the critical care setting with up to 30% of muscle mass lost within the first 10 days of ICU admission. Additionally, geriatric patients admitted to the ICU may already have a history of sarcopenia and have lower muscle mass at baseline, which places them at an even higher risk. Patients are at risk for developing osteopenia with prolonged bed rest due to decreased weight-bearing activity. As such, there's a reduction in the bone formation while typical bony resorption continues, thus resulting in a net reduction in bone integrity. Skeletal changes do occur at a slower rate than muscular changes, but it's still a risk nonetheless. There are also some significant cardiovascular changes as well. A shift in blood volume from the legs to the chest in supine leads to an increase in cardiac workload, elevation of resting heart rate, and a decrease in the heart's ability to pump, resulting in a reduction of cardiac output. Increased heart rate leads to a decreased diastolic filling time and shortened systolic ejection time, which makes, it, or makes the heart less capable of responding to the metabolic demands of movement. So what is early mobility? It's a variety of interventions aimed at restoring function to be initiated as soon as the patient can hemodynamically tolerate it. And it includes what we have listed below, but I have some examples. So passive active assisted and active range of motion are performed in order to allow adequate range of motion to perform activities of daily living. So for example, our patients who have been supine for a while with their ankles kind of resting in plantar flexion, they tend to lose some ankle dorsiflexion range of motion, which can really lend to difficulty or pain with standing down the line. So it's important to intervene early here. With respect to positioning, physical therapists can assist with management of patients with sacral decubiti by fitting them with pressure relief cushions to help facilitate a more healing environment while still allowing them to get out of bed. In terms of pulmonary toilet and airway clearance techniques, many people think of uh, manual percussion and vibration of the chest when we're discussing pulmonary toilet or airway clearance, but there's so many different interventions in our toolbox that we can use. And mobility and upright positioning are always the first line of defense. There's also active cycle of breathing, postural drainage, vests, just to name a few. Initiating upright has so many psychological and physiological benefits. First and foremost, it assists with arousal level. Now I can get all scientific and drone on about how this movement stimulates the reticular formation and blah, 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 but I have a better example. How many times have you said that you're gonna watch a movie while you lay down on the couch only to wake up to the credits? Who really wants to wake up and interact with the environment when they're supine? Definitely not me, which is why I'm upright sitting in my couch right now giving this presentation. Uh, upright really facilitates patient engagement, especially as we're weaning sedating medications. In addition, it can help to reduce the risk for orthostatic hypotension by providing a little bit of a vascular challenge, and it also helps to improve lung recruitment. We're fortunate enough to have ICU beds that allow for passive chair position, which can be really helpful in determining if the patient will tolerate a more metabolically demanding task of mobilizing to the edge of the bed. And standing transfers and gait, they may not always look like what you think of in the traditional sense. We can utilize tilt tables for more functional weight bearing body weight support harnesses to initiate a gait cycle, 
and hydraulic stand assist when patients don't have the lower extremity extensor strength to complete a stand on their own. And we also include strengthening and aerobic conditioning. So it's important to know that early mobility is safe and feasible. The Bailey et al. study was one of the most important articles to come out that supported early mobility in the ICU. Over a six month period, they recorded activity events defined as sitting on the, on the edge of the bed, sitting in a chair in ambulation. And they also recorded adverse events. They noted that 103 patients participated in 1,449 activity events, which is a lot. There were 593 activity events in patients with an endotracheal tube, 42% of which included ambulation. Overall, there was less than 1% of activity-related adverse events and none of which included accidental extubation. Johns Hopkins, a hospital system very similar to our own, completed a similar study, but on a larger scale. They performed a prospective observational study looking at more than 1,000 MICU admissions from July 2009 to December 2011. Of 1,787 admissions of at least 24 hours, 62% participated in over 5,000 physical therapy sessions, which is a ton. And that was conducted by 10 different physical therapists. A total of 34 or 0.6% of the sessions had a physiological abnormality or potential safety event, with the most common being an arrhythmia, hypertension, or hypotension. Only four of those events or 0.1% required minimal additional treatment or cost without additional length of stay. And the analysis of those 34 physiological abnormalities or potential safety events demonstrated that there were no cardiorespiratory arrests, no removal of central venous or dialysis catheters or endotracheal or tracheostomy tubes. Not only is early mobility safe and feasible, but it also improves quality outcomes. The Schweikert study was a randomized control trial that included 104 patients that were sedated, mechanically ventilated for 72 hours and were functionally independent prior to admission. So a lot like our COVID-19 patients. Um, Computer-generated randomization placed them in either early mobilization with concurrent sedation interruption versus usual care of daily sedation interruption and PT-ordered PRN by the primary team. 59% of the patients in the intervention group returned to functional independence upon hospital discharge, compared to 35% in the usual care group. In addition, the intervention group had a shorter duration of delirium and more ventilator-free days. Again, no patient was accidentally extubated and only one adverse event of desaturation to 80% occurred. Morris et al. Used, utilized survivors from their 2008 parent study to determine if medical variables and early mobility were associated with hospital readmission or death. They found that patients who participated in early mobility, regardless of the number of conditions or the chronicity of those conditions, had fewer hospitalizations. Those who did not participate had higher odds of readmission or death. This study demonstrates that rehabilitation is potentially a modifiable variable that can help minimize the risk of mortality. Needham et al. looked at a quality improvement study within their 16-bed MICU at an academic hospital, again, much like our own. And the QI period involves 57 patients receiving mechanical ventilation for at least four days. And they executed the following steps. They changed the admission activity order template to reflect activity as tolerated rather than bed rest. They encouraged a change in sedation practices from use of continuous infusions to um, as needed boluses. They established and disseminated simple guidelines for cons consulting PT, OT, and PMNR. They changed staffing to include a full-time PT, OT, and a part-time rehab aid. They consulted physiatrists for MICU patients receiving rehab, and they increased consultations to neurologists for MICU patients with muscle weakness that was severe or prolonged. Now, with these QI changes, they noted that there were more rehab treatments for pa per patient, an increased number of treatments involving sitting or even better, so standing or walking a decrease in MICU length of stay by 2.1 days, a decrease in overall hospital length of stay by 3.1 days, and also a decrease in delirium. Now, ICU acquired weakness, it, this is um, actually being seen a lot in COVID-19 patients. It's clinically detectable weakness in which there's no plausible etiology other than critical illness and characterized by bilateral symmetrical 
limb weakness. It could be a result of just disuse atrophy, critical illness myopathy, or crit critical illness polyneuropathy. Now, like I said earlier, a catabolic state develops rapidly in critically ill patients, especially those with sepsis. Immobility increases the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and reactive oxygen species. And then with the res uh, subsequent muscle proteolysis, that promotes the overall muscle loss. There's a general shift from slow, twi slow twitch type 1 to fast twitch type 2 muscle fibers, leading to reduced muscle endurance. And studies have shown that skeletal muscle strength declines by 1 to 1 1.5% per day when strict bed rest begins. Now here you can see some risk factors, systemic inflammatory response SIRS, ICU length of stay, duration of mechanical ventilation, hyperglycemia, hypoalbuminemia, parenteral nutrition, corticosteroid admission, administration, oh goodness, and um, neuromuscular blocking agents. Now, CIM and CIP, they both manifest as symmetric flaccid limb weakness and ventilatory muscle weakness. Most times, facial muscles are spared. But with um, critical illness polyneuropathy, it's also, you also have diminished or absent deep tendon reflexes, as well as a loss of light touch and pinprick sensation. ICU-acquired weakness develops in more than 25% of patients who are mechanically ventilated for more than seven days. Now, in terms of diagnosis, ICU-acquired weakness has a cutoff score of less than or equal to 48 on the Medical Research Council scale. Now in this scale, there, the sum is determined by testing the strength of three movements in each arm, so shoulder abduction, elbow flexion, and wrist extension, and each leg, hip flexion, knee extension, and ankle dorsiflexion. The strength is scored from zero, meaning no contraction, to five, meaning normal power, yielding a maximum combined score of 60. So some investigators also utilize less than four in all muscle groups tested as a defining feature of ICU acquired weakness. So it's either or the 48 or the less than four. Now you have muscle biopsy and electrodiagnostic testing with nerve conduction studies and electromyography that help to confirm the CIM or CIP. Now differentiating CIM from CIP may not change management, but it does impact prognosis. Per the CRIMINE study done by Guarneri, Bertolini, and Latronico, the presence of neuropathy with or without myopathy portends a worse prognosis than myopathy in most studies. Ali et al. performed a prospective multicenter cohort study from May 2005 to April 2007, including patients that required mechanical ventilation for at least five days for a total of 136 patients. Once the patient demonstrated a RAS of minus one to plus one and scored at least an eight on the attention screening exam, their muscle performance was graded based on the MRC and hand grip dynamometry was also performed. Now after this exam, patients were followed until discharge for ventilator use, hospital survival, and other secondary outcomes including ICU free days, hospital free days, ICU readmission, respiratory failure at the time of ICU readmission, and discharge location for all survivors. 35 of the 136 patients had ICU-acquired weakness. Mortality increased as average muscle strength or maximum hand grip strength declined. And after adjustment for severity of illness and organ failure, the odds of hospital mortality were significantly higher in subjects with ICU-acquired weakness by the MRC exam. The numbers of ICU and hospital free days were also significantly reduced in ICU-acquired weakness subjects by the MRC exam. A prospective multicenter observational study was done by DeJong et al. to assess the correlation between respiratory limb muscle strength and their contribution to delayed wean from mechanical ventilation. Again, 116 patients were mechanically ventilated for at least seven days. And once they were able to participate in an exam from an arousal perspective, the muscle strength was assessed by the MRC, as well as the maximal inspiratory pressure, maximal expiratory pressure, and vital capacity. And they discovered that the severity of limb weakness quantified by the MRC was correlated with respiratory function. So a low MIP, MEP, and MRC score were independent predictors of delayed extubation. So what are some perceived barriers to mobility? This is in general, not necessarily COVID related, but we have that the patient is too sedated for PT. Well, can PT be coordinated during a spontaneous awakening trial? 
remembering back to what I had said about the Schweikert study, patients had much better functional outcomes when early mobilization was performed in coordination with a sedation wean. Clearly there are times when this isn't feasible as if a patient develops event dyssynchrony, they're hemodynamically unstable or they have severe agitation. The patient is, respiratory status is too tenuous. Well, can RT briefly increase the support or FiO2 during the PT session to allow for more tolerance of mobility? What's the patient's stability on their current settings? Are they tolerating the turns with nurses? Are there rescue options should a patient decompensate? So we may not necessarily see somebody who's on volume control at 100% because there's not a lot of uh, room to help them out. But if they're on you know, pressure support five over five at 40, we do have a little bit of room to help them. The patient's on pressors. Well, vasoactive agents aren't always a contraindication for mobility. Rather, it's, it's important to look at the trends in the dosage to make a more informed decision. So obviously, if doses are rapidly escalating, it's better to hold off. But if they're stable, a slow progression of mobility with close hemodynamic monitoring will determine how well the patient can tolerate an increased workload. So maybe going from chair position to edge of bed to standing up at the, at the bedside. The patient can't mobilize because they have XYZ line. Well, lines also aren't necessarily a contraindication to mobility either, but some may require some specific handling or precaution. So just some brief examples, if you're trying to coordinate when the CVVH system is down, that's helpful. Or if the line is really positional, maybe have the RN present to manage it. Um, always assessing an arterial line waveform just to make sure there are accurate readings and noting the ETT location pre and post session to make sure the tube hasn't migrated. Now some rehab uh, considerations specific to COVID-19. We're aware that patients with COVID-19 require low volume lung protective ventilation and some significant sedation initially. So as such, we've been initiating evaluations anywhere between hospital day seven to 14, mostly to check into range of motion and potentially place the patient upright in chair position. Even if they're like a RAS minus four and they have low muscle tone, we can still prop them with pillows and modify the chair position so that the patient's uh, maintain cervical neutral and that the ET tube is secure. Most active physical therapy occurs after the transition to pressure support ventilation. Now, when we're looking for patients that may be ready for more active interventions, we're looking for stable and or improving pressure support ventilation settings as well as their PF ratios. Close coordination with nursing for down, tit down titration of sedation for PT when appropriate has been more of the norm than an actual true spontaneous awakening trial, just because of uh, the polypharmacy and the solar sedation weans in this patient population. The patient's tolerance of PT while on pressure support ventilation is often very telling and could potentially expose whether or not the patient will tolerate weaning of settings or even extubation. Additionally, many of these patients are developing VAPs and consequently have a lot of secretions. Given how we're trying to limit bronchoscopies because they are AGPs, participation in PT and more aggressive mobilization can certainly help with airway clearance. Finally, we're also noticing a number of brachial plexus injuries, rotator cuff tears, and impingement in patients that have been prone. So it's really important not to flex the shoulder too high when placing the patients in swimmer's position and to be extra cautious as you rotate the arm. Remember, as you're doing a proning, um, the patient is paralyzed and they won't be, their muscles won't be able to guard against a potential injurious movement. So we have to be very cautious. So what does early mobility really look like? I, I wanted to give you guys some examples to see what it is that we actually do. On the left, we have a gentleman using our quick move device, which allowed him to um, use a crossbar in front of him to pull into standing with some assistance, um, external assistance from the PT. You can also see that there's a little tibia block here so that his knees don't buckle completely and we can, we can control a descent back into the chair that's behind him. In the middle, there's an orally intubated patient on a tilt table where we can work on upright tolerance, um, lower extremity weight bearing and some pre-gait activities. You can actually take one leg out of the strap and help to do some anti-gravity um, hip flexion and some simultaneous upper extremity exercises. And on the right, we have a patient in chair position of the ICU bed utilizing our Motomed bike, um, which allows for passive and active movement. Here, the patient, she's completely active, working on her aerobic endurance despite the use of vasoactive agents and CVBH. 
On the right, we have an orally intubated patient that's walking with his nurse, PT, um, and a respiratory therapist that's in the back. And on the top left, we have a patient that was actually cannulated for VV ECMO with a tracheostomy ambulating in the hallway with RT, RN, a PT, and a chair follow. So what is it like for a COVID-19 patient to go, go through a complete rehab progression? So I have some two examples for you. One is, um, this is a more typical progression. So hospital day one, they're admitted. Hospital day six, they're intubated. We didn't initiate PT evaluation until hospital day 17, at which point they were on volume control um, at 30% and a RAS minus five. So we really just looked at their range of motion um, and performed some stretching. On hospital day 24, they did transition to um, pressure support ventilation, but their tidal volumes were at, in the 600s. So we're just being a little cautious and making sure that we're not going to cause any kind of barotrauma with an increased tidal volume. So we deferred edge of bed and we just wanted to see how they, how they did and just looked at stretching and uh, rolling. On hospital day 26, they had a trach placed. Then on, the, on hospital day 28, they were stable on pressure support still on a little bit of Presidex and Dilata, but they were following command. So we decided to mobilize to the edge of the bed. And the patient was moving their upper extremities more than the lower extremities at this point, but they were completely um, hemodynamically stable throughout. On hospital day 29, they transitioned to trach mask. Then on 31, they were sitting edge of bed and out of bed to the recliner. By hospital day 32, they had improving anti-gravity strength and were actually able to stand from the bedside with a two-person assist. Hospital day 33 stood three times using a pull to stand, that quick move device that I showed you two slides ago. Um, and they did that with one person. So from going from two people to stand to one. And then finally on hospital day 35, transferring to bedside chair with two person assist. So you can see it takes about a month for a patient to be able to participate in really like very active PT. This is a little bit uh, more of an anomaly here. Um, this is a pretty amazing progression, but um, we have hospital day one, the patient was intubated. Hospital day five, they were cannulated for VV ECMO. From hospital day six to 21, there was intermittent use of paralytics. The patient wasn't quite stable, so we held off. Finally, on hospital day 22, we initiated the PT evaluation. Paralytics were off, and we did just some range of motion and stretching. Hospital day 24, they were decannulated from ECMO, and by hospital day 25, we started uh, actually getting the patient into chair position despite being on volume control. And they were following 50% of commands while they were on three different sedating agents, so that's pretty impressive. By hospital, two days later, they were on um, pressure support ventilation at 30%, and they were still on those three sedating agents, but still weaning slowly, following 50% of commands. So we got them to the chair and participated in some um, strengthening active assisted range of motion. Hospital day 28, still weaning that vent, still on some sedation, but we were able to get them to the edge of the bed that day. Hospital day 33, failing uh, SBTs due to the work of breathing. They're only on five over five. Um, they're only on Presidex, so they had made a big, um, a significant wean in sedation over those five days. Alert and following command, so we were able to use that quick move device again, and the patient was able to stand. By hospital day 34, they were extubated. The next day, walking in their room on two liters, we prophylactically increased to six liters because we know in this population, they tend to desaturate pretty quickly and significantly. Um, they were stable throughout that session. And then hospital day 37, they were walking hallway distances with a rolling walker on room air and discharged to rehab. And after that, they went home within one week. So it's, that was pretty impressive. Well, that's all I have for you. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. You learned something new and you're ready to put in some PT consult as we ride the he rehab wave of COVID-19. Thanks for listening. Yeah, any questions for Lauren? If you guys could put them in the chat, that'd be great. And maybe we'll have her for a couple more minutes to answer. That was great, Lauren. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Usually if you wait a little bit, there'll be a little question or two, but sometimes oh, sure. on Mondays there's, you know, people. There's a lull. I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> Well, it seems like there's actually no questions for you right now, but of course, if there are questions later, feel free to email us and we'll reach out to Lauren and, um, and 
at the answer to your questions. So thank you so much for coming and hope everyone has a great week.